Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hello, hello, and welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Beautiful people. Today, we're talking to Tim Tactics, who worked for the German government. Tim has had numerous experiences with advanced technologies and shares his insider knowledge from 10 years of work in undisclosed projects on the topic of the current disclosure. His deep understanding of the mysteries of the universe come from his extensive contacts. Dare to Dream podcast won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, won the COVR Award for Best Radio Podcast Show, Welp Magazine, named Dare to Dream one of the best 20 podcasts to listen to this year, and it's high ranking under self-improvement in Apple Podcasts. The show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. If you would like to do any energy work with them, go to accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility expert, and I'm a book writing coach. I help you take your book from the inception and the idea to published. And also, I've got a team that takes your book to a guaranteed international best-selling status. And finally, I show you how to be interviewed on radio and podcast and get massive results. If you would like to learn how to be more visible now, in your world, in your business, I've got a gift for you that shows you how. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. Well, my guest today, Tim Tactics, is a governance expert from Europe. For almost a decade, he worked as a tactical advisor within the covert governance sector in Europe which aims, among other things, to understand the missions and strategies of non-human intelligences on our planet and beyond. He was in experiments with exotic life forms, beings not from this earth. And Tim also reports on his numerous experiences with advanced technologies, plus the mysteries of the universe. You can find him on his website at allshifthappilynow.com. And additionally, Tim and I are both speaking, presenting in September at the Portal to Ascension Glastonbury UK conference. There's going to be a link in the show notes so you can buy tickets to attend this amazing upcoming conference. And with that, I welcome Tim Tactics to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you here. Debbie, thank you so much for having me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Mm. Although there's a lot in your bio that I could really skip around, and I do want to start for me and for the audience with the inception and where you began. So if you don't mind briefly to talk a little bit about your background, your story, how did you even get involved? How did you get asked by the government to be involved with this investigating UFOs and advanced technologies? Well, in the first place, I didn't. Um, it all so the recruitment process is um, now slowly changing, and we've seen that uh, you know with the establishment of certain uh, other branches like the space force and so on. Um, this clearly comes from the fact that the recruitment process of these non-disclosed uh, advanced projects uh, is pretty heavy. It's um, it's a long, ongoing process that took several years. Uh, and there, other than, you know, in comparison to usual recruitment, um, there's never like a job interview where people are saying like, hey, we'd like you to read that and uh, sign up for that. Uh, it is more that uh, I got recruited very, very early on. I was in, uh, you know, university at that time. 
um, law school, uh, and I got asked to um, to become part of like conventional governance projects, which um, uh, is um, mostly looking into the situation how to steer the um, uh, you know the 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 public diplomacy um, around countries. Uh, uh, which means basically if people have like certain projects, how to implement them so that uh, they can be lawfully integrated, but also accepted by the uh, majority of the population as well. And then, um, you know, things, uh, it took basically four years and I was like down the rabbit hole faster than I was like, uh, yeah, than I was able to realize that it's happening. Um, so it, it basically starts with like little sprinkles of information that land on your desk. Um, for example, uh, I was at that time working on a certain project, a certain project uh, that had nothing to do with UFOs or ETs. And then you get um, new documents to analyze. And one of these documents, and it was a historical project. So one of these documents then was like coming from the Vatican and talking about um you know, people in medieval times uh, speaking about the presence of reptile beings. Uh, yeah, something like that. So, uh, and you don't think much about it, I guess. At the, well, at least I didn't at that uh, at that time. You know, because you you treat these sources, these um, these historical th sources, as uh, uh, yes, yeah, as, as 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 part of that site guys as you know you don't you don't necessarily necessarily take that and say like wow that is major news you know this is like someone in the some someone like 500 years ago talking about mystical creatures but also talking about jesus angels and uh other uh you know uh beings that uh you know that could be placed into like spirituality or religion or something so that is how it went and then it went let me ask you a quick question about oh, yeah, that sure. piece when when this came across your desk tim was it written in such a way that at that time in medieval times that this was actually accepted this was like yes of course there were reptilians and there were angels and there was yeshua or was well, it written as though some government at that time knew of these beings and it was still not disclosed yeah that's a that's an interesting question um it's it's much more profane than that actually it's a it even came in latin so it i completely had to uh to translate it uh which um my colleague at that time which was much better in in uh in in translating latin than than i was so it took me like multiple days to even uh, analyze these latin texts texts because they like you know, uh, also written in a different kind of Latin. It's a clerical Latin, and so on. So, and he was like fluid in that, which which always astonished me uh, in some ways. When he was like, when I took like the whole weekend for that, and he was like just reading it fluently. Um, so it was one of these documents that came in Latin, and um, it wasn't. Uh, you know, it, there was no reaction put to to it. It's just like it was someone, some author. Uh, writing about reptile beings but again you get like these these documents like multiple times in a month where you just have like some author talking about um meeting you know seeing uh the, you know jesus christ or the i don't know like like an angel or some some kind of spiritual appearance or something uh you have a lot of these documents so it's it's nothing where where um there was either like a a, a certain reaction put to it nor would it you know make me react in a certain way and that was like the the moment where i believe that these documents find my found my desk in order to check how is he going to react to these things uh -huh. and then more stuff happened so um uh the next stage would be that i was invited uh within this um this um, environment that i was working on i was invited to an experiment because it was like a, a highly um you know, educated uh, uh, surrounding and they had different other stuff going on and they were shooting uh, 
well, I, I don't quite know actually the the the, the setup of that the, uh, that experiment. But what they did was like they were opening up light, uh, and that is pretty spectacular. So they asked me to join, and the fact is that light, as we perceive it, is just like the outside edge of a wave, right? Light can be like a wave, and it can be a beam or like a particle. Uh, and we only perceive, perceive a certain outside edge of that. But the reality is just as much as we see the surface of an ocean, you can dive into that ocean and you will find reality, like realms, life environments. And what they did was like they opened up this, this, um, this light uh, wave and there were beings inside of there. At least there were like appearances in there. So it wasn't like uh, clearly communicated to me like hey tim oh my goodness we made contact with beings that live in light no they are like hey we are opening up uh light the wave of light uh and do you want to see what we would then almost like as like um a fata morgana or something like an optical illusion is appearing so you could see these these beings and it turned out that these beings are actually real beings but i realized that many 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 years later and the last time that i that i had like this clicking moment was um when i met linda molten howe who's uh you know you know her right yes. right it's uh she's like an award-winning journalist and and uh she and i did like um tell my told my story on gaia on truth hunter and uh she was extremely critical at first, but then I told her some information and then she opened up so much and she showed me her book and she was interviewing someone telling like uh, with a near death experience and they saw these beings. Um, and I said like, and, and that girl made like a drawing and I said like, my goodness, I made a drawing of what I saw back in these experiments as well. And we took them, put them close to each other and they were exactly the same. And then I went to Jeff Mara, who you know too, because you're on that as well. Uh, and he was saying, uh, Tim, last time, last night, I had someone, a doctor from a ch children, uh, a kid's hospital. And these kids have, they talk to something invisible, some, some beings that, you know, seem to guide them into their last, you know, stand between, you know, in their last transitional phase. Um, because apparently that is what these beings do. They they create afterworlds. And they were, and Jeff, and I was describing these beings to Jeff, and he was like, wow, that is exactly what the doctor was saying too. These are these beings. But I realized that many, many, many years later, at that time, it was just like an extremely interesting experiment where you could actually see like beings wobbling in like a field of light and it was like incredibly interesting. And did they make contact with you or was it uh, strictly visual? Well, at that time, it was just like uh, it, it was it didn't come to me as like contact. It was like more like uh, if you if you watch like an incredibly detailed uh, holographic projection or something, it was it, there was never the point where it was like, oh, my goodness, this is major news. I can't. I can't or something, you know, it was just like I was watching that and I, I thought like, wow, that is like, that is pretty interesting. And then, then I went on. The interesting thing, why they called me in, because again, I, at that time I was like working on something in the medieval times. Uh, and as you know, the Templars uh, played a huge role in that huge time, in that, in that time period and so on. Uh, and these beings showed themselves uh, with classic templar robes they even had the red cross on their templar robe um and that was like the linking point to my project and then they were also like hey tim it's super cool want to see it in like downtime or something so that was like that is how you get recruited over time and then they see how you react and then you get you know you go deeper the rabbit hole and may I ask, prior to this and prior to even your job, you're still in law school, were you a believer? Did you have UFO experiences or were you a complete non-believer and this was all new to you? Well, when I when I left these projects, uh, I never would have 
expected that people do not know. Uh, that was something that was like uh, pretty, pretty drawing to me, and and to the to the closing the gap between these these uh, you know projects and the reality that I that I had when I was like uh, when I was interacting with like the the norm stream world or something. So um, uh, it was like for me, it was like a given fact and a reality. Nothing that I would ever think about in in a way that we're not alone or something it's just like uh as much as i see that there are like cats and dogs and different other species or like uh but let's let's say like microbacteria or something it's nothing that we see but it wouldn't shock you or anyone if someone was saying like hey on that table there's like a billion billion microbacteria living there that's like okay okay yeah sure sure you know that was like the attitude that i had and yes uh in like the the beginning like in my my early childhood uh, at home there were like interesting and weird events uh you know that happened and that clearly makes sense because i i feel like uh, people are being contacted and then there's not it's not a coincidence that you you uh you land in these projects then Mm, so interesting. And I have to ask this follow-up question about the robes. Could you describe these robes? Because uh, I, I am familiar with the Templars, but I have no idea what they wore. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the Templar had this um, Maltesian cross, which almost likes, uh, like looks like the the cross that Jesus, um, you know, was was nailed onto, <laughs> um, but it's like a red cross, um, and uh, yeah, that was actually they were wearing that on the robes. The, the the knights, the Templar knights, were uh, wearing that on the robes, and these beings, um, they had uh, gray skin. They had a a um, a roundish but a little bigger skull than usually. Um, they were not the grace, which is kind of interesting because they're, you know, apparently we call these these ETs sometimes by, you know, the the most significant optical, uh, you know, thing that that happens that that we see, like oh, they have gray skin, or they so they are the grace or something, but that is that is not the way that you classify life forms, you know, that's that that would be like uh, saying like. Um, Hey, these people with a nose. I've I've visited their country, and then you think like, what what country did you visit? Like, there's a lot of different countries with people with noses. Uh, so there, it happens that that there are a lot of beings that have gray skin or different other skin tones as well. But Linda Moulton Howe was like saying these are the greys, and uh, said like uh, this is a different species, but they are also gray. Uh, and apparently, what what I realized many, many years later is that they built uh, worlds in the afterlife. Because as we know, the whole world is an illusion. Uh, reality is an illusion, that, but it's a very tangible re uh, illusion. And the universe is one, well, the name say it, says it, it's one big life form. And something that the universe doesn't want to experience is trauma and uh, stress and all that kind of stuff. So death for some beings might be a, a, um, a reasonable mechanic in order to get to go from one place to another incarnation or something. But it shouldn't be like the the completely chaotic, traumatizing effect uh, or event or something. So they kick in and they create these afterlife worlds. Uh, where beings um, have these, you know, these experiences, like a park, for example, where, you know, you meet with other souls that are also there. You see your family, you see some nice beings that say like, hey, welcome here in this park. Uh, you did well and, uh, and now it's time to move on. And then they get a hug and then you, everything turns into light and then you go from there into another incarnation and you're reborn. So that is something that they do instead of going into a realm where you realize, oh my goodness, there is nothing but real nothingness and everything is just a mental, uh, you know, mental illusion. 
Um, I was so things, curious right? about these beings because when you said that, it was a little bit arresting for me. I started a couple of months ago, um, I'll just call it in the most pedestrian terms, I stopped dreaming. And I definitely started leaving my body and experiencing other lifetimes and just having other experiences. One of them was extraterrestrial and it was quite beautiful because I opened my eyes and I was surrounded by light beings. They were tall, but not as tall as I've seen more a little bit. Yeah. Maybe six feet tall and full of light, but they were wearing these white robes and almost <clears throat> the top was conish and came down and just these white robes and just this luminosity was coming from them. And I just, that you know, they were surrounding me. It was like a ceremony and I felt super loved and cared about and seen and I didn't know if they were my family or who they were, but I felt really honored. And then I woke up, Tim, and I was like, can we please do that again tonight? Please, oh, can we beautiful. do that tonight? I want, oh, I want. So I didn't know if that was what you were describing as these beings. How recent was that? Very. Very was, recent. Yeah, about a month ago. Wow. Well, maybe there's, I mean, there is no coincidence in the universe. So maybe because we're talking about that, maybe that's like uh, first contact in that in that kind of way. Now we're talking about these beings. I can actually show you a, uh, a drawing if you want to. It's uh, uh, unfortunate to all the radio listeners out there, <laughs> but you can still go on uh, Debbie's YouTube and uh, and watch the uh Watch the visuals there. Um, so it's a drawing that I made for the, um, uh, well, I made it for, for Linda Morton Howe and the, uh, the Truth Hunter episode. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, I can't, I can't share my screen because you deactivated that. Uh, no, you can, you can. I actually gave you a oh, hosting you privilege. Yes. Oh, now I can. Okay, good. Okay. So there we go. You should actually mm, see these. Wow. Hopefully. You drew that? Yes, I did. I did. Um, yeah, and as you can see, there's like um, the 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 robes. And, and that is like the whole thing, like like how I saw it. You know, there was like this, this um, almost like a, um, like the surface of water, but it was like invisible, invisible, it, not invisible, but invisible light. It was like a a light uh, surface that opened up, and um, as if they as if they were like swimming in there. Uh, and these were the beings. Didn't say anything. Nothing happened. But that was um, that was my experience. It's beautiful. And oh my god, their elongated hands, amazing yeah. fingers. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. was that actually the purpose of this experiment that you got? invited to was it the purpose that they felt when they put on this light in particular that that you would have access anyone who was there would have access to see and experience these beings or is that a, a fascinating anomaly that just took place no well um so first of all i can't i can't really say what the purpose of that experience experience was uh because i i can only from from like retrospective, I can only tell that these were probably the milestones that brought me into uh, the ET um, undisclosed worlds uh, and so on. So deeper into the rabbit hole, as I <laughs> like to call it. Um, so there was never a moment where someone like, was like, hey, Tim, we showed you this because that and that they were like always very intransparent um but uh i i the 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 beings were already there so when they were like telling me hey tim uh there is something going on in that department you know where they use these lasers and these big machines and so on uh do you want to come over like uh i don't know this guy and that guy is also there um we found something really interesting because we have like uh, a holographic image where we opened we opened like the wave of light and they're like uh, beings and they have like a tempera cross i don't even think that they said like there were beings i only they i assume they were saying like hey we have this 
um, these visuals and they 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 show Templar crosses. Do you want to look into that because you are also uh, you know involved with that history of the Templars at that time? Um, so yeah, it's it's just like you know friendly colleagues inviting you over, uh, showing you something for and, a cosmic experience. Oh my goodness! Yeah. And in that environment and being 18 or something at that time, and I was like not thinking about, about it much, to be very honest. Incredible stuff. Well, let's go back in time. Let's get a historical overview, if we can, of UFO sightings and encounters, especially World War II and beyond, just to give our audience some context. Yeah. Um, well, we've been visited quite a lot in the last few thousand of years um it depends how far we how far back we go so uh usually in in history you have like different eras uh of like modern history and then uh like ancient history and so on and so on and all these different uh eras come with different uh you know et experiences so if you want to go back only like in what we call like the modern modern history uh, then clearly World War II uh, was like a major turning point, um, you know, for Europe as and Germany as well. It was like um, something that happened in the 1930s already. Um, many people might not know that. David Grush actually was sent from the US into Paris uh, talking to Le Parisien and, and he, he gave an interview and it was uh, he was basically exposing Mussolini, who was a um, leader dictator at, at that time in Italy, uh, who, who had, you know, found a crashed UFO. Um, the Germans as well, they didn't go too much into that history for certain reasons. Um, but the World War II was like a heavy turning point for like modern society, modern governance, modern governments to find out about the presence of UFOs. But if you go back even further, uh, and and clearly you know that, and a lot of prob probably your listeners know that as well, um, there have been instances and contacts and visitations for thousands and thousands of years. And even 15,000 years ago, we had like a different different civilizations living on this planet before the big cataclysm happened uh which is a cyclical thing it's um something that i found information on as well in these uh, projects that um the time of the cyclical uh you know development on this earth is happening right now again and and the reason why we have these talks why i can like share some stuff and why we are going to have more information in the next few years is because we're in the middle of a cyclical cosmic event on planet Earth. Okay. Is this the sort of thing, I know Matt LaCroix talks about it and Graham Hancock, about the history of this planet and the cataclysms that happened that basically wiped out humanity and you know Noah's Ark and so forth, but many others and how we would ostensibly come back again and is that the level of which you're talking about is potential utter destruction well i would say wiping out humanity is like a very harsh uh <laughs> formulation to be honest so everything in the universe at least in this this version of the universe that we are living in right now uh and don't want to spoil it for, for others but there are different other versions of the universe that can be quite different and even more exotic than the one that we are experiencing here. But the one that we are experiencing here is a solar-based dualistic universe. Uh, it means, uh, you know, you and I can experience uh, ourselves as you and I. <laughs> and um, the sun is actually bringing a lot of the the data, the data, the, the information, the consciousness into our world. So uh, light can carry information. Um, so that is why the, the light uh, and the sun is so relevant. Everything in this version of the universe is happening cyclically, which um, apparently we can see day and night, uh, summer, winter, um, but also, uh, you know, the equinoxes as well, which is um, a moment where this planet has like different energy flows onto it. The, the, the energies get compressed at, at certain times in the year. Uh, but then 
we not only have the earth but we have the sun itself and the sun of this solar system is also moving it's not a fixed star it's it's moving it's uh it's rapidly uh rushing through um it has its own orbit uh around a much 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 more uh denser and uh you know uh, richer in in mass object or entity let's put it that way so the the sun is flying through this through the universe at a rapid speed and it it draws all these planets with this uh with us with her um so and and we are circling around the sun so the sun is actually uh, also in cyclical orbit which takes much longer but at certain times uh this sun and the whole solar system is entering a universal spot where there are more information more data available it's more it's denser it's more packed uh and these times happen on this planet around every 15000 years and i think uh graham hancock and others uh they have found you know good proof that this happened um we find uh, magnetic changes in the soil. We've we've seen that fifteen thousand years ago. Uh, we find that the solar activities are changing again, and they have been changing, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we find in a lot of the bi bi biblical texts and the ancient texts, we find uh, talks about the flood, and so on, and so on. So all this stuff happened, and. 15,000 years ago, again, we had a different civilization living on this planet. Now we have a different one again. And 15,000 years ago, um, there were like three different pathways what, where these beings actually went. Uh, apparently, they all, um, they all uh, vanished, but that doesn't mean that they are like wiped out. It just means that they reacted to that phase that we are entering again and some made it up some made it down uh and some are still living on this surface planet so that i if i understand you correctly tim when you say some made it up some left this planet galaxy to go live in another and when you say some made it down they went inside earth to live Exactly. So um, imagine 15,000 years ago, you have like a uh, huge, hugely well developed, developed civilization that has built uh, all these temples, all these beautiful and extravagant um, structures that can't even be built today with today's measures uh, and, and means. But and and then something cosmical happened, something cosmic happens, uh, where like, the earth core stops rotating the magnetic poles change the water masses get like turbul um get in and like turbulence and basically like swap over some of the the land masses um and it was like an emergency moment um that's for sure but um we have uh found evidence that some of these being some of these people at that time were rescued uh for example um, by beings that do live inside of the earth. So for everyone who might, uh, just just for everyone to, to bring everyone on the same page, the, the earth itself is not a solid structure. Uh, it has gigantic uh, caves uh, that, you know, build huge, huge, huge areas uh, under the surface. And we know, and this is like already disclosed in the last uh, couple of months too. If you Google that, you're going to find new information about that secretly sprinkled into the public discourse um, that they are like huge caverns, uh, huge caves, uh, you know, underground that can carry more water than the whole water of every ocean on the surface of this planet. And these are just singular caves. So you can imagine how big and 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 you know vast these areas are and there are beings living there as as always uh, wherever there's like a life environment there are beings that utilize this life environment you have that in the seas in the oceans uh, the mountains the skies um on the surface of course as well and these beings came to the surface and took some of the the you know remaining uh beings of that civilization took them underground 
uh, and they are living there for thousands and thousands of years and they have created an alternative or like structures, civilized structures, very comparable to uh, the surface humans. And um, well, governments found out about it in the 1960s when they were digging uh, into very, very deeply into the soil and uh, suddenly a big, big, big uh, crack appeared and um, <laughs> land masses fall into this huge hole that appeared in like, I think like Nevada desert or some, somewhere in the North Americas. And they basically were looking down onto a city as huge as New York City or something with huge buildings and everything. Uh, so that was the moment when um, by accident, uh, we made, made contact with uh, <laughs> other humans inside of the earth. How do they live without the sun? So they have water, <clears throat> no sun, no moon. If they're inside the earth, what do they draw from? Well, the, the the advantages that these beings have that they when they are living inside of these um, these caverns or these tunnels or these caves is um, that they are mostly unaff unaffected by everything that occurs on the surface level. So no storms, no um, no rapid water, um, you know, erosions, uh, nothing like that is going to happen if you like inside of the earth crust sixty miles deep or something. Um, the thing about that is that they had to establish themselves over time as well. So, uh, while there was like, at first it was only like an emergency, um, you know, hideaway place, but over time, it seems that they, these beings have settled there, uh, and over time have, have also come to, uh, develop technologies, um, just as much as, as we have technologies and as much as we have artificial, uh, lights, um, this is absolutely feasible and doable, and they utilize these lights as well. Mm. And so when this happened 15,000 years ago, is this is this the major harvest that you talk about? Is it the same occasion, experience? It's interesting that you call that the harvest because um, the grace, um, which we also had contact with, uh, they called it the har harvest as well. Uh, this is the the other option that happened. Oh, by the way, talking about your last question as well, we also have to assume that these people at that time, 15,000 years ago, they were well established and they were utilizing, uh, you know, the, the natural energies um, and, and phenomena uh, of this universe uh, very sophisticatedly. So these aren't cave people or something, but these are people that have created structures uh, like... Uh, in the Egypts, uh, uh, in in you know these huge temples and so on and so on. So they were aware of how like electricity uh, worked back then already, and you can find certain symbols uh, in in like the the hieroglyphs and so on, and certain uh, you know certain proof to to that that they knew that you know there are certain charged particles and so on and so on. Um, so this all was known to them. Um, and when you're talking about the harvest, it's it's very interesting to me because you're utilizing that that word and the grace were uh, describing it that way as well. Uh, and they were also, there were also different ET species that were kicking in and taking some of the material, what that is how they call that. They took some of the material away from the earth uh, and integrated them into their own uh, kind and the, into their own species as well. So ultimately, uh, these cataclysts didn't wipe out the whole civilization, but they uh, they made these civilizations change in a major way. And some of them uh, have founded gigantic civilizations inside of this earth, outside of this earth, and they're still here and they're still involved and they know what's happening on this planet because they've been here. That is so amazing. It reminds me of, you know, I got really obsessed decades ago when I heard about the Telos who live underneath Sedona. And that's, you know, well known in the Sedona region and that they were initially from Atlantis or, or Lemuria. And when that cataclysm occurred, well, some of those people escaped and went to Egypt. You know, some the ones who went by sea on a boat were very successful. But there was also a modicum of people who went under earth and they do call them the telos. And I remember 
again, my sister-in-law, because she's been into this stuff way before me, would send me these books. And it's funny because I wasn't actually a believer at the time, but there was something else in me that was like, oh, I have to go to Sedona. I have to have this experience. And I felt that way until I finally went. And, uh, I, you know, there was a, a slow awakening in me for a while, but I, it sounds a lot like that. And I guess every so often, it's rare, but every so often, one of those beings will come to the surface and I bet a little bit like Sasquatch, right? And they'll be seen and there's a big hubbub about it and then nothing again. But it, for a lot of people, it just proves, yes, they do exist inside of the earth. Yeah. That, that is very true. I mean, we have um, cave paintings um, where, you know, you see these um, these old humans, these ancient humans, and with, you know, very weird, not weird, but very exotic life forms um, standing next to them. Um, the truth is that this planet itself is mostly an ant planet. Uh you should know that there's like, I think, 127 million ants come on one human. That's how many ants are living on this planet. And um, the reality shows that some of these ants are pretty, pretty far developed as well. So in consciousness and so on and so on. So we don't only have these, these um, you know, pretty small ants that live on the surface level, but we also have like seven, seven foot uh, mm -hmm. seven feet tall ant beings that wow. live here and there are certain tribes all of, over the world in um, south america in northern america in uh, the asias and africa as well that talk about these ancient you know uh, ant beings uh, that sometimes occur to be on the on the surface even though they actually live inside of the planet inside of the crust quite deep but sometimes they come up and sometimes they are seen and i actually i'm i'm on instagram uh tip tactics by the way <laughs> and they there's like one girl that um uh that was really shocked because she's from indonesia and she she found me on gaia and she was like uh she had nothing to do with ets but she ran into one of these these gigantic ant beings and at that yes and at that moment she she had no idea about what happened to her she was she was in indonesia she was going into the forest she had no um no spiritual um you know stories or um, experiences before and she suddenly heard a voice inside of her head repeating the end the 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 ground people are here the ground people are here the ground people are here and she didn't know what to do with that uh it it apparently seemed to be like a, a for a warning or something like if you if you go further you're probably gonna ran into us we're not dangerous but we want you to know so you you are prepared that we're here uh that we share the space with you and she she basically ran well, she she went on and she she basically ran into a seven uh, feet tall ant being that was on the on the surface, standing there tall uh, up front in front of her. And that was the night when she she well, she she ran away, but she um, looked into Gaia that night. She subscribed to Gaia. She um, looked into cosmic disclosure, into, uh, uh, you know, uh, Truth Hunter with me and so on. And then she wrote, texted me on Instagram uh, and said, like, I, I she couldn't make sense of what happened to her. And I explained to her, well, you ran into an ant being and there's like uh, a huge population of these beings. Usually you won't see them, but apparently you are one of these um, rare individuals that have. It's nothing it's, to be worried about. Incredible. Wow, what an experience. And when you describe them, I mean, we know ants as being phenomenal workers, right? They're the phenomenal. ones and they can carry, I forgot how many times their weight yes. and they work together. Ants yeah. are known to be a tribe that they have one vision and they're going to build something like a New York City under yeah. the earth. I mean, they could actually do that in it and at, at least seven feet tall. That's yes. beyond possible. She also had like in, she had um, incredible photos of of all of that, um, which she showed me on Instagram. She was too scared to publish them, but it was like 
it was inc incredibly detailed uh took with a an iphone or something so it was like a very very rare occasion and i was uh lucky and happy to to have these uh to have this um this conversation this upcoming but um you're right ants are are very 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 um they work they work relentlessly um especially all these tribes these ancient tribes that talk about these gigantic ants uh they always they always say that uh and for me i've i've read some stuff about these this these ground people i personally am extremely interested in them even though i have never met them yet uh hopefully that will change at one point uh, but i'm so freaking interested in them because uh the stuff that i read uh it's still it's not completely clicking in in like in the way um that it makes sense to a human mind ants are so complex like for example something that just made more sense to me in like the last few weeks because i'm i'm constantly you know re um thinking about about these documents that i've read is um that these ant beings for example they have a certain portion of their population that are so called um in english you would say runners or explorer ants and these beings just go out into the world and and they are meant to to actually die if needed so they they have no um no fear of dying they are extremely courageous and just go into other places and just in order to to um to explore new places and humans i mean you know sometimes the human species has that too when i'm thinking about like you know people that freely get into a rocket and let themselves shoot you know into the sky or something um or like the first person that you know tasted a potato and uh uh was lucky enough not to to eat the 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 poisonous um leaves uh, but was able to then tell the tribe hey potatoes are nice which uh germans apparently benefited very much from because they are the number one e eaters of potatoes in the world but uh <laughs> other than that it's like um usually humans have a different routine a different evolution and and they behave differently and to me that is like extremely interesting and these ant beings have developed a because they're also extremely extremely sensitive psychically sensitive mm -hmm. sensitive to to different um wavelengths and so on so they can they um uh, ants and insects uh, in general are extreme and extremely uh sensitive towards electricity the way they communicate is through mostly like telepathy and and certain other sense and so on so it's it's incredibly interesting how they are you know developed and the documents state that the ants are actually going into realities and they they have learned techniques in order to 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 um you know dig holes from one reality into another reality which uh is so exotic to me uh compared to what you know humans can do especially because humans always rely on technology in a in a major way you know if if um someone wants to open like a portal they will build some uh, sort of accelerator or something some ty type of technology and these ants and typically insects they become the tool in their own evolution and that is something that i'm like extremely fascinated by and when you say they dig their way to another reality do you mean like literally digging Physical. yeah li like literally so so it's and again i'm still processing what i've read in these documents and and uh, right now i haven't met them yet again i'm i'm open for that because i'm so interested in that but just as much as ants that you know dig themselves into the soil like regular surface ants like the smaller ones uh these ant beings very very sophisticated very very evolved in in many ways uh, they have consciousness uh that is like more intelligent than if that is even possible to judge that in that way but uh very very evolved consciousness um and um uh they seem to at least as that is what the documents are stating they seem to have found mechanical ways to utilize themselves in order to open 
portals from one reality to another reality. They are not even utilizing portals, but they are like digging themselves into the reality realm. Uh, and that is something that um, I'm, I'm, I'm very often thinking about. And it's so exhorting and far off from what comes to human mind that I'm like, uh, it, it's just, it's just so interesting to me. Me too. Are there any other exotic life forms that you know of or have experienced that are, you know, really significant? Well, I think we should we should really uh, emphasize that there are like other intelligent beings that live on this planet at the very moment. Um, and I'm not even talking about visitors because, yes, we do know that, that there are constant visitors and visitations from other planets and they're mostly in disguise or they hide away or try to not influence or intermingle with the, the, the human surface species. Um, but we do know that, for first of all, this planet was an ant planet. Again, 127 million compared to one human comes on one human. Um, so these these beings live here 60 miles underneath uh, underneath the surface. Um, we do also know that some that there's a specific type of reptile species that has survived. Uh, the aftermath of like the dinosaur age and again that is millions of years in and you better believe that in millions of years uh, beings evolve consciously very much so um, these seem to be uh, a species a, a reptile species uh, that comes from the dinosaur age and when the huge cataclysm happened and and mostly all the dinosaurs you know extincted then uh, these special type actually made it into the caverns as well and survived the cataclysm and had few millions of years to establish a um, sophisticated culture themselves. That's so interesting. It makes me wonder, as you talk about this, Tim, so what was that like? So most of these dinosaurs are going extinct, but there's a few outliers. This is just my imagination. There's a few outliers and somehow, and they're trying to escape with the impending doom. Do they find a cave opening? Does something from living all these miles beneath the surface come out and, and recognize and rescue or want to like Noah's Ark bring in this breed? Like what happened that yes. allowed them to take that huge change into this completely different lifestyle and start do, yeah. to create from there. I believe you just said it completely correctly, you know, just something that that happened and uh, certain species, um, you know, were on the vanishing point. Uh, and, you know, as, as much as um, as uh, Darwin's theory needs some some uh, reworking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right but where he's right is that uh whenever there's a species that fits into their life environment very well uh it has high chances of like uh surviving and uh, evolving and so by any chance some of these um beings and it seems to be like a um a certain uh species that is like related to um uh, raptors and and these dinosaurs which are already said to be extremely intelligent at that time right mm. uh and these beings very very also not 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 super large but just as big enough to to go into certain you know holes and certain caves and um yeah if that happens and a species lands in a, in a better life envir environment that is more stable and they they manage to fit in there um they have uh, quite a good chance to develop. They must have had raptor rehab because, you know, <laughs> they were some of the most dangerous dinosaurs living at that time. They were murderous, right? What they were capable of. So to consider that they're now living under the earth with many other species, ants and and other reptiles, et cetera. And it must be peaceful, right? They're breeding and living and having full cities and lives. So they must have had some kind of way of switching around their behavior that they were more inclusive and collaborative with other beings. 
Yeah, I mean, so interestingly enough, I've, first of all, I've never been to to the inner earth. I've only encountered people, colleagues that you know have have um, looked into these cases uh, and analyzed that. Uh, but it seems that they have like very sophisticated structures there. Of course, it's it's different, very exotic and different to what um, humans have set up. But apparently, if you take multiple millions of years of e evolution, uh, and and you're already such an advanced uh, creature or being, because if you think about the raptors at that time, they developed very smart, you know, techniques in order to hunt, in order to socialize, and so on. We all know that. Uh, already from from their you know their origin their processes and so on um if you take that into consideration and now you add like multiple millions of years uh this human species is not that old and and they have managed to set up like a uh rather intact uh civilization and societal structure um, then you have that too, but it seems like these um, these reptile species down there they are still like um, they're still into meat. Uh, so um, and uh, we've always been warned that um, uh, there are some of them that would not you know they they would not you know have like a bad um, a bad time eating a a human. It's not something that regularly happens, but just as and people are like some people that I told them they were like shocked, like oh my god, how can they eat a human? But I try to explain them for them. They they do not like hunt for humans and eat them or something. It's just like as much as usually you and I and other beings, we would probably not uh, you know take a cow and kill it ourselves and eat it but there are some humans on this in this uh on the surface planet that um rather enjoy eating a steak sometime and um you know that is like the situation that 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 they have uh, down there so they're mostly sophisticated enough to to not do it but um there might be uh a hunter or so that might be interested if by any chance a human would ever choose to go uh, miles and miles and miles of uh into into like caverns and tunnels into the earth which probably is not going to happen anyway <laughs> well said i want to go back to what you brought up earlier about the sun tim because i have seen the news so i mean think most people are aware of the solar flares but i've seen the more recent news and the magnetic poles and some of the shifts and what don't we know what don't the majority of people know about the sun that is really important and impactful to us? Oh, that's a brilliant question and very, very, um, very, very important, Debbie. Thank you for asking that. Um, so, first of all, I want to take everyone back uh, into these times when you, when, um, when people were still thinking about the sun as a god. Right? You find that everywhere in all cultures all around the globe. The truth is that the sun uh, gives a lot of the, the data and a lot of the input that we utilize in order to build our own consciousness. So we get the, the consciousness that we perceive as our own personality, as our own character traits and, and our own awareness, we get that directly from the sun, just as much as every single life on this planet utilizes the sun in order to to grow and and thrive and evolve right um plants do that but everything is actually emitting and interchanging photons and sun uh sun information at all times it's always happening so the sun plays an enormous role for life but also for consciousness as well and that is the reason why all these these um di different civilizations 15000 years ago and throughout time we're always uh, considering the sun as the sun god the god of the sun and so on and still we we do see that whenever you want to indicate that something has consciousness you have a you make it like a a golden halo around their their face right jesus has that and um certain you know vishnu and and buddha and so on they're always depicted with one big halo with one sun behind their hat 
indicating that they became aware through the the consciousness of the sun that they are actually not the person with the the, the ego but they are more like the con the the universal cosmical uh, phenomenon that directly comes down from the sun activity so the sun itself at that very moment is is actually entering a phase and a region in the universe that has tensor energies mm. tensor energies mm -hmm. that means more information is is hitting the planet and we know that the norm stream media is currently talking about that uh they bring that into relation with um you know computer technology saying there could be a big blackout and so on and so on uh, I would uh, personally say there's like a different reason for that, but um, the reality is that the more sun activities we have, the more information flows into our consciousness, and that will absolutely, absolutely influence consciousness on this planet. Not only our own consciousness, but dogs, cats, elephants, uh, <laughs> reptiles, every single uh, being on this planet and other planets as well will go through this phase where more information will hit their consciousness. And you can already see on Instagram, there are like, uh, you know, all these videos of dogs pushing buttons and talking to the, you see them, Debbie? Yeah. <laughs> I'm obsessed with them. Honestly, I follow a dog who sits at a computer, <laughs> but my favorite is Luna. Luna is a doodle. And her owner says, Luna, what's what is not nine minus three? And Luna sits yeah. there and you can tell Luna's thinking and then she taps out. Taps her shoulder. Yes. It's wild. It's amazing. It is freaking amazing. And that is happening currently in, in front of our eyes, right? And it's it's it, it's so so important to open the eyes of people to just realize that. Um we always talk about these convincers in, in the prog um, programs in the projects excuse me um where we where we say it's so important that being that people see what's happening it's so important we see cats i've seen videos where cats are like uh where you, where someone is like greeting a cat and that cat is actually replying and and giving their best attempt to to give back the greeting right we have some some videos where it's like hey buongiorno and the cat is like buongiorno you know it's it's hilarious it's beautiful you've seen apes utilizing ipads iphones guys how 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 real can it get right this is all happening in front of eyes we i've seen videos now now they um they found out that dogs can actually ride cars so they they've yes <laughs> it's real it's real they've done a study on dogs and and there's like dogs that drive cars of course they have like little blocks on the on the pedals so they can reach them and so on and so on but it's hilarious all that is happening then there are like birds that already imitate the human language tone to tone perfectly you know they they speak and they answer and they make jokes and all that kind of stuff it's all recorded and seen on 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 instagram youtube and so on and then of course something that we also have to to take into consideration ai I mean, humanity has been looking for intelligent life um, for so many, so many decades. And now actually we, we can see that there's a an life form that is rapidly evolving and developing so much faster, so much more rapidly uh, than any human could ever do. And it's happening right in front of our eyes, right in front of our eyes. This is so fascinating what you are sharing right now, Tim, because last week I had a Swami on the show. Uh, he's an Italian Swami, but from the lineage of the Indian masters. His name is Shivananda Swamiji. And so he only speaks Italian, by the way. We had a translator. Wow. And I, I have witnessed his healing, doing darshans, blessing healings for groups and individuals. And I was always fascinated because I would see the person laying in front of him and I would see the Swami looking off, but he was not blankly looking off. It was abundantly clear to me that he was communicating. There was something giving him direction. And so I couldn't wait to ask him this question. Like, 
What are you engaging with that gives you this information about the person and direction about how to work with them and heal them? And I'm thinking he's going to say it's Sai Baba. There's some kind of being that has transcended that he communicates with. And you know what he said? Tell me. He said, it's the light codes. I receive light codes and those codes have information from the sun that wow. tell me what to do. And I have... I keep mulling this over the past week. What does he mean by this? And here yeah. you are giving this information about the sun is downloading essentially information to us, which also coincides with this information we're receiving that we are in an ascension, right? And part of the ascension is like a lot of people are feeling physical things and meant some tiredness and a lot of a little bit of overwhelm that there's so much coming at us so i'm putting what you are saying together with the idea of ascension with the idea with the swami said and it makes me wonder is this at his high level of being what he's able to comprehend that these are light code sources tell like programming right coding that he's getting that are informing him what to do yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reality seems that we get all the information. We are all linked to the sun in in ourselves. Um, it is. It seem. It's only. It's only seemingly that we live these independent lives with our own, you know, own character traits, own personalities, own egos. But the reality is, we all are linked to what is outside of the the sun, and the sun itself on an, like a cosmical plane it's it's serving it's more than just like a a huge burning rock in the sky or something it is more like a portal between what's behind the sun mm -hmm. uh and behind the sun there is like this unified field that that we gain all these information from uh so yeah we we are the sun we we are the embodiments of the sun uh which makes us you know well pun intended the sons of gods uh right and daughters as well <laughs> to to make it to make it very very uh real because that was like a huge thing in in human history as well that uh you know you know the masculine the the feminine was like distorted but yeah that's 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 very real and it's happening and the sun is not only influencing us it's also influencing uh well apparently computer systems uh, and their consciousness as well, because the AI is um, is part of this consciousness experience just as much as any organic life form is. That is so incredible. Wow. Okay. I want to get to the fact that you have had over 100 face-to-face -face meetings with the Greys. That is so, so cool. Can you describe the encounters and how have they influenced you? How have they changed you? What did they teach you? Oh, we could fill books and books with that, Debbie. And um, with your expertise, maybe that's even a good idea. To do. Mm -hmm. Well, the um, the reality is that, uh, yes, there, there have been contacts with other life forms and other exotic life forms uh, within these groups for at least since th since the 1930s uh, in Europe, um, Germany at that time was like looking into into um, ufology, into other life forms very much. Um, we know that um, certain political groups in in uh, in Germany at that time they had special departments looking into ufology. Uh, the U.S. Uh, came; they had a little a little late start um they they made up for a lot of that over time but um they came into that awareness in 1947 when the famous infamous famous uh, Roswell Corona crash happened in New Mexico uh the very month where um they uh, deemed the necessity to um to found the CIA uh in order to make sense of all these new uh new developments in the world that is where the when the CIA came into play when they when it was founded it was just founded after the Roswell corona crash um 
And ever since, um, there have been visitations from certain species, especially those species like the greys that have a hierarchical um, pyramidal societal system where they where they um, accept or uh, deal with um, you know certain groups being on top of other groups. Uh, they they clearly you know have made contact with um these advanced groups these military groups these governance groups and so on and so on so it could have happened over time in the 70s 80s that you know military and governance and so on they were looking into all these different setups into all these different possibilities doing these experiments and suddenly like grace would appear on that spot and would like advise them on something or even get in contact with them and so on and so on. Um, these were like, and, and we know that the greys and a lot of probably a lot of the, the viewers and, and the audience um, have potentially made contact or even seen some of them or had some, you know, some type of interaction because that is kind of common uh, actually uh, on this planet to, to have seen some traces on them. Um, so that being said, when I came into that that program, it was all about finding out who the Grace are. I mean, they they knew who they are, but they wanted to know about their intentions uh, because apparently humans were were very very quick in uh, getting into con contracts with the Grace, uh, receiving a lot of the technology that um, has been you know uh undercover and and been hide away from uh, from you know the 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 norm stream reality uh and from the public eyes but a lot of this technology comes from the grace and the grace give these technologies but they also always want something in return so a lot of these contracts that humans uh you know uh, contributed to uh didn't you know fully made sense at the, in that um at that time um so uh, basically the program that i went into was like what is that why is that and what do they want and what did you discover what what do they want why was that i mean it's interesting because i know in the spiritual community they often say no you know energy is energy so there needs to be some kind of reciprocity. I give you this, you give me that, even if it's a donation. So that that's very interesting to me. What what was their premise for creating that setup, and what did they get out of it? Yeah, I mean, there's something in in humans, you know. Uh, in in Germany, we say, or in German, we say, when people get big eyes, you know, that means like uh, you see something that is like it's flying, it's beautiful, it's fancy, and you want it, you know. Yeah. And that that is like the 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 early mentality when once like the shock, the shock moment wore, wore off. Um, that you know, there are other other life forms that are incredibly more advanced than. Humans humans once once that shock was done uh humans were like oh okay what what do we do with that man they have like fancy stuff uh we we want fancy stuff as well that is just like some some type of ape behavior i guess uh typically to to humans and and so they went into that without even uh you know thinking about you know what they want in return um and apparently you know there's some something about the histor history of humans having uh you know treated other humans in like exploiting ways if you think for example about you know the way that um the europeans went into the americas and met these natives these native americans and basically opposed their um you know their system onto them and try to you know got them into contracts to give some parts of their lands to these europeans um and for like low price uh and and basically the development of the natives after that for thousands like hundreds of years for hundreds of years was like very very troublesome very chaotic and and uh not like you know not on reciprocal level or something um so apparently there's something within the human that uh tells him yeah we don't want to be that we we don't want to be the the exploited 
being, you know, we don't want to be on that side of the table. Uh, and that was the motivation uh, to set up these programs. Um, and um, yeah, they they um, offered me that. I was interested. Little did I know how, you know, extremely stressful and, uh, and uh, yeah, how much that could have been and how much that would have been. But um, yeah, we went into that. Um, it, there were like certain setups. Uh, there was communication and... Um, basically, the grace that we were communicating with, with um, they were explaining themselves as a gardening uh, species. Um, it took us quite some time in order to figure out what they, um, what they, what their actual name is. Especially to to translate that into German was like a major task and took us quite some weeks in order to figure that out. But ultimately, um, we. Uh, we came up with the translation of um, uh, the order of the first, of the first order. Interestingly enough, the Disney company took on uh, that name quite in the same year that I was translating that. So uh, maybe a coincidence, who knows? Uh, but <laughs> apparently their self, uh, their self-understanding, their self-reflection is um, that they they see everything as like a version of one of a one creator being that we all used to be in the beginning of of when the universe came into awareness that we are life uh there was like a singular being that has like set up all of this now this could be like confused with the concept of god but the reality is that we've never left this stage of being we are still connected with this fundamental one creative field that we are you know we are speaking about the zero point energy field we are speaking about the divine we're speaking about the one creator or something that is something that i've always heard and that i always heard in the the spiritual community and that is true that is that is what we are what we are still what we still are even though we are now you know embodying different character traits and and playing this illusion of being divided and what they want is to establish a universe where everyone, every aspect of this one creator can be unhindered in their own evolution. Um, because they believe that through this evolution that everyone has the freedom to evolve in their own ways without, you know, taking someone a slave or something uh, and hindering someone else's evolution, then we can get to a harmonious universe where it's just like, in a united field again uh, and the grace happened because of their own evolution and so on they came to a point um where they you know they they um they can't cross that point without finishing their mission and their job it sounds a little bit like there's no individuation and that there's a bit of a hive mind is that correct uh interestingly enough yes and no because there is like yes they do have some type of hive mind i would agree to that um but there's also a very low amount of individuation too uh you could feel when there's like a gray um that has like more of like a female or like more of a masculine energy or something there seem to be also soul aspect they they do clearly have a soul um, and they they clearly have um, certain preferences in in the way very very little compared to the expanded you know will that a human might have in a way that you know I, I want this and I I am gonna do my way or something that's not how how the these grace work but um, they do have they also have like the freedom within their own system to incarnate and to go into wherever they want to so if they personally feel uh oh my i should go into uh i should go and like i don't know experience uh being among uh, humans or being among ant beings or something um they will utilize their technology utilize utilize whatever they have uh, in order to to gain this experience, because they believe in that, they believe that the more experience we may we have, we collect, we accumulate, uh, the more the whole universe becomes a transparent and and growing, evolving system. 
Well, I have about four more things to say, but I want to preface all of it by saying you must come back on the show. <laughs> I will. I'm happy to. It was a fascinating uh, talk. I love it. This is there is so 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 much I want to dive into with you and thank you for bringing it. I really appreciate it. All this wealth of knowledge, it's just fascinating. And thank you're you so much, Debbie. Your story, you know, what you've experienced thus far even. Wow. Yeah, we didn't even like cross the surface. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well, so let me ask you this. Why you? Why you, Tim? Why do you think in this timeline, in this lifetime, in the work you did in this field, that you have become a visible spokesperson for this? Have the planetary, uh, otherworldly planetary beings ever discussed this with you or your higher self or guides and counselors ever said, yeah, this is your mission and here's why? No, actually not. Um, I, I, I would, as dry as possible, say that I was like, the best suited for that job and i i would still say for my own story i'm still the best suited to tell my own story right <laughs> so there couldn't be another another one uh telling in that way so um and and everything that i've you know learned and and experienced and and so on on this on this planet and and in my life um it all it all came in very handy in in what I'm doing right now and like preparing people for this reality and so on. Um, I I I do very much believe that you know that in this reality we need certain certain steps for our own evolution as well. And um, apparently, I've become like a different different being in the in the time that I've been here. Mm. Very much so. I'm, I'm very, very different compared to when I've when I've started being on this planet. Mm -hmm. So, and and I'm I like myself better now. So I'm 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 quite happy that um, that I I made this progress. And some of these these logics that came into place were strong enough to evoke this um, this change in myself. And I like that. You're one of the few people who's probably ever come on the show in almost 17 years who can actually say my name properly. My father was born in Austria, so part of my family is from there. Just please say my first and last name. Well, it's uh, Debbie Dachinger. Dachinger. Uh, I, I realized that the American tongue has uh, some kind of uh, muscular issue with pronouncing the ch. <laughs> Dachinger. How would exactly. you pronounce your name? <laughs> well, you know, it is Debbie Dachinger. And yes. uh, people here say Dashinger. Dashinger, okay. Interesting. Which has a ring. Uh, you know, I take it. I think it, it's lovely and beautiful, but it's really not my name. It does have a ring. And um, I I compliment you on your uh, work very well. <laughs> I can see that you have German uh German genes. <laughs> yeah, Germanic for sure. Yeah, I and I know a little bit of Yiddish and and all of that. Uh, so, which is a bastardized Germanic language, and and I, yeah, I love all of that. That comes easily to me. I want to mention to folks who are watching right now or listening that again. You and I are both speaking at the Portal to Ascension Glastonbury UK conference. It is in September. So I know you're doing a presentation, but you're also doing an after conference talk. What can yes. attendees expect from your presentations? Oh, interesting. Um, good that you say that. Everyone who goes to portaltoascension.com can not only uh, book tickets for uh, Debbie and my appearance uh, on the conference, at the conference, but um, I'm actually on Portal to Ascension this Saturday as well. So we uh, dive into 70 years of unacknowledged ET contacts. So if you're interested in that, it's probably just the it's the, the prolonged version, the in-depth version of what uh, Debbie and I talked to. Uh, talked about today um it i will also tell some stuff uh you know about their european history something that i would usually not share publicly mm -hmm. but i'm uh i'm i'm just gonna do that on saturday 
in reasonable terms uh, to connect some dots and and because like the story about World War II is just uh, it's it's a very very interesting fascinating time for humanity at that you know so I cover that a bit and um, on at the conference I am uh, diving into. Uh, what do we learn from these contexts? So, what can we do? And what, how do, how does that actually affect our own evolution? Um, and uh, if I can say that, I've, I also welcome everyone to follow me on Instagram, which is Tim Tactics, and Tim Tactical in one word on YouTube, uh, especially on on Instagram. I'm uh, I'm really holding the community together and sharing like wisdom clips and preparing everyone because something that you and I haven't talked about yet Debbie is um, what can we do in order to prepare ourselves for this upcoming shift and uh, apparently it's uh, well it's about consciousness and everyone listening here congratulations you made it to the forefront of um, the beings that are meant to stabilize and balance this earth uh, you have taken on a very, very important mission and, and job on this planet. Um, so prepare yourself very well. Uh, see some of the wisdom that Debbie is sharing and take in some of the wisdom that I am sharing. And um, together we can utilize our mental awareness uh, and also our emotional capacities in order to help other beings uh, go through this process and you know being integrated about what's going to happen in the next one two three years that's right yeah for sure we will cover that the next time you're on because this is a huge topic for me really is to prepare for this and also folks tim's website all shift happily now.com and the tickets, the Portal to Ascension, September, Glastonbury, which, by the way, is a sacred site for Yeshua and Magdalene. We'll be doing tours like that besides the conference. It's going to be amazing. And, and the speakers are amazing. Neil Gore, who is hosting Tim on Saturday night on Portal to Ascension, is also our event producer. And I'm sure he's speaking because he's so knowledgeable. Uh, so we'll, I'll have the ticket link here in the show notes. You can just go there. And Tim, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Wow, Debbie, that's an amazing question. Um, something I've never been asked before. Uh, my future dreams. I'm. I'm. First of all, I'm. I'm super grateful and happy to to communicate and to connect with all these beings and these souls on this planet. Um, through my work on with the community on Instagram, on YouTube, and within the spiritual community, I've met so many incredible and beautiful souls. And coming from all these programs and and uh, projects, um, you you see that there's something depersonalizing in inside of these these programs, right? It's um, uh, you know it it helps people to to do what they do, but they depersonalize everyone. And now in this phase of my life, I'm so, so happy and so lucky to um, to realize the how unique and how beautiful the the individual soul can be and is. so i'm I'm super happy to grow this community further and to to prepare people. I have different uh, programs and different information and different layers of information for different people, um, depending on where they stand, uh, what they do and where they want to go. And I'm happy to provide this information to prepare everyone and to see all of that growing is just one of the one of the most beautiful dreams because I'm these creative moments in universe in the universe are just fabulous. And then I also uh, then I also am happy to connect with um, you know the other friendly life forms around around this planet and beyond. And I can't actually wait uh, for this moment when we do have like an established open contact with friendly beings, with beings that are interested in in setting up beautiful relationships. I am so excited too for this undeniable first open contact. I know what you and I, Tim, did today is a first wave contact. And I have been told by the extraterrestrial beings, this is very, very important. This conversation we have for the people who are waking up, for the people who are hungry, they want to hear this. 
And so yeah. thank you so much for the service you're doing. Thank you too, Debbie, because you're, we're all on the same team here. Uh, and uh, yeah, all shift happily now. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. I end today's show with this quote from Metrodorus of Chios. It is unnatural in a large field to have only one shaft of wheat and in the infinite universe, only one living world. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment and share. Next week on the show is going to be the amazing Adam Apollo. He's back. Adam is a planetary ambassador, exopolitical advisor, unified physicist, and Jedi guardian. He's phenomenal. Can't wait for that conversation too. And remember, folks, if you're listening and you want to see us, go to YouTube or Spotify under my name, Debbie Dashinger, and you can watch us and even see the pictures that Tim brought on the show. And remember, you're such an important part of this conversation. And as I was emailing to somebody today who said, oh, I'm just coming out of the ET closet with what I know. And I said, my darling, you're not coming out of any closet. You're waking up to who you truly are and the truth of what is truly out there. And so it is for all of us. Thanks for joining us today.